everyone, Reverend Dorr here from Faith Community Church. Welcome to our online midweek Bible study. You know, for the past two weeks, we've been studying the final outcomes of the seven bold judgments as they pertain to the fall of Babylon as seen in Revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18. We learn that Babylon is not only a city in Iraq, but it's speaking of a worldly system of religion and commerce. And this system church of false religion and corrupt commerce is already operating on the earth today, and it will come to full bloom during the Great Tribulation. In a final act of justice against all evil and sin in this world, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is going to return to earth in order to establish his kingdom. Now, this is the message of Revelation chapter 19, where we're going to begin tonight's study, the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But before we do that, I cannot stress enough to you how important the first three chapters of Revelation are in helping us lay the proper foundation for understanding the rest of the book. You see, the first three chapters establish the position of the church as it pertains to God's final judgment. So I want to encourage you, beloved, if you haven't heard these messages yet, please look at our YouTube page and you can access this entire series. Well, at this time, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Revelation and we're going to begin reading in chapter 19. <clears throat> what we're going to do tonight is read through several passages so that we can see it in context and then we're going to go back and study it verse by verse. So let's begin at Revelation chapter 19, verse 1, and we'll read through to verse 4. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Okay, so let's stop there and look back again at verse 1. John says, After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. As we learned in a previous lesson, the opening phrase of this chapter after this reveals that John is about to witness something new. He hears what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. Now, some scholars believe that the sound of this chorus is that of the multitudes of angels in heaven. Having finished the pouring out of the seven bowls of God's wrath, this angelic chorus resounds now in praise to the one who executed judgment as stated in verse 2. For his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Now we learned in our study in Revelation chapter 17 that the great prostitute is speaking of Babylon. And as I stated earlier, Babylon is not only a city, beloved, but it is a system. Babylon represents the world system of false religion and false commerce, evil commerce. Babylon is actually everything that is wrong with this world. God judged the great prostitute in chapters 16, 17, and 18 for corrupting the earth with her immorality. Now, the word used for immorality here is pornea. And from it, we get our English word, pornography. Pornea encompasses all forms of sexual immorality, all forms of promiscuity 
and fornication. It also is used in connection with all forms of idolatry and even whoredoms, which we know to be prostitution. Now, there is no question, beloved, as to the judgment and destruction of the Babylonian system and all who follow in her practices. For heaven exclaims in verse 2, for his judgments are true and just. Beloved, make no mistake, there is no question regarding God's judgments. You see, when God decrees a thing, you must know full well that it is always always right. The Bible warns us to not be in love with this Babylonian system known as the world. Hold your place in Revelation and let's take a quick look at 1 John chapter 2. That's the first epistle of John and we're going to read from chapter 2 verses 15 through 17 and I'm going to be reading this passage now from the Amplified Version. Here the Apostle John admonishes us, do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, craving for sexual gratification, and the lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life, assurance in one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things, these do not come from the Father, but are from the world itself. Verse 17. And the world passes away and disappears, and with it, the forbidden cravings, the passionate desires, the lust of it. But he who does the will of God and carries out his purposes in his life abides or remains forever. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the Apostle Paul instructs us, do not be conformed to this world. In other words, beloved, do not be identified with the world. Do not be shaped or molded like the world. Do not think like the world. Do not talk like the world. Do not hear like the world. Do not act like the world. He goes on to say, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Beloved, how do we renew our minds? Well, we renew our minds when we read and apply God's word to our lives. In other words, we must read the word and then we must receive the word and then we must respond to the word. We need to read it, we need to receive it, and then we need to respond or act upon what we have received. That's how we renew our minds, reading, receiving, and then responding to the word. The book of Revelation, beloved, was given to us so that we can do this. Remember chapter one said, there is a blessing to those who read aloud, who heed or take in and live out this prophecy, who obey it. So we have to read it, we have to heed it, and then we have to obey the words of this prophecy because this Bible, this book, especially in Revelation, is given to us to equip us and prepare us for the days that lie ahead so that we can be ready and that we can finish strong in this life. Let's get back to Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to pick it up now in verse 2. Later in this same verse, we're told that the judgment of Babylon is God's righteous vengeance for the blood of his servants. Now, you know, Moses wrote of God's vengeance towards the righteous in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43, where he says, Rejoice with him, O heavens. Bow down to him, O gods, for he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. We see that this passage here 
is confirmed by what we just read in the book of Revelation. That God's vengeance is poured out through these seven bold judgments, through this, through this wrath of his to avenge the blood of his martyred saints. It says in verse three, once more they cried out. This is in Revelation 19 verse three. Hallelujah, the smoke from her, speaking of the great prostitute, Babylon, goes up forever and ever. This is talking about the judgment, beloved, that's going to fall upon this great prostitute. And it's speaking about the eternal punishment that's going to befall all those who refuse to come out of the world and its sinful practices, which is its rebellion toward God. Now, take a look at verses 4 and 5 in Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verses 4 and 5 states, And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Here we see the 24 elders and the four living creatures joining this heavenly chorus to worship God. In chapter four of the book of Revelation, we discovered that the 24 elders represent the raptured church in heaven. Now verses six through 10 further confirm their identity as we are brought into the marriage supper of the lamb. So let's begin reading at verse six. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, pure. for the fine linen, listen, is the righteous deeds of the saints. Oh, beloved, did you get that? Every act of kindness, every act of mercy, every act of righteousness you and I perform in this life is what's preparing our garment when we stand before the Lord. We will be clothed with the righteous deeds that we performed on his behalf, in his name, with his power. How glorious is that? Verse nine, and the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. John begins this passage in verse six, telling us that he then heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude. Here in chapter 19, verse six, John once again describes the sound of a multitude as that of one voice. And if you remember, those of you who've been studying along with us, he gave a similar description in chapter 14 of Revelation verse 2 when he described um, uh, the voice that sounded like the roar of many waters, the sound of thunder and like harpists playing on their harps. And we discovered then that that voice was identified as the tribulation saints. And we also learned in that lesson that the sound of heaven is unified. So here, with the chorus of angels, the tribulation saints, and the 24 elders representing the raptured church and the four living creatures, we're hearing a chorus, a multitude, again being defined as a, a roar of many waters, but yet it is the sound of one voice. That is the voice of heaven, beloved. 
And that should be the voice of the church. It is as one sound. There are no divisions, no fractions, no dissensions within this chorus. So now joining the chorus is a great multitude crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. And verses seven and eight helps us to identify this great multitude. I kind of gave it away in my statement before. Look at Revelation chapter 19, verses seven and eight. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made himself herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Beloved, this great multitude now comprised of the angels, the raptured church, the tribulation saints join as a heavenly chorus of praise to our God for the marriage of the lamb has come. Now, in order to better understand the timing of this great event, we need to understand how marriages were performed in Galilee when Jesus was on earth. <clears throat> You know, the Galilean wedding was unlike any of the other traditions in the region. It was unique. And we have to understand that Jesus was brought up in Galilee. He knew Galilean customs and he understood Galilean traditions. And he spoke many times to his disciples using Galilean imagery to convey his messages, especially when it came to the end of the world and his return for his bride. Now, before his death, he used this language to encourage his followers to continue steadfastly in their faith in John chapter 14, verses one through three, where he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Church, you've got to get this. Jesus is speaking here of covenant language. He is speaking here in covenant language to his disciples. And he, they were all from Galilee here. And so they understood these Galilean traditions. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And this is depicting his covenant union and bond with them, his deep love for them. Because beloved, this is the covenant language of a Galilean wedding. Galilean weddings in the first century were carried out with many very specific traditions that every couple was expected to follow. And these traditions are carried on till this day. In ancient times, the father of the groom selected a bride for his son. Now in the language of this tradition, Jesus told us in the gospel of John chapter six, verse 65, that no one can come to him unless it is granted to him by the father. You see, beloved, no one comes to Jesus unless the father draws him in the same way that the father of the groom would select the bride for his son in a Galilean wedding. The father of the bride and the father of the groom would then negotiate the price for the bride and come to an agreement. And the two families would meet at the bride's village, at the village gate. There, the groom would offer the bride a cup of wine. Now, this was their betrothal. This was when they really enter into their covenant agreement. And this is the first phase of the Galilean wedding tradition. The bride is offered the cup and she must accept it willingly. You see, a Galilean wedding, beloved, was not a forced wedding. It was not a forced marriage. 
Unlike all of the other traditions in the region, this bride, the Galilean bride, is being given a choice to accept the groom or reject him. In the same way, beloved, you and I are given a choice upon hearing the gospel. We are free to either choose Jesus willingly as our eternal bridegroom or we're free to reject him. Understand that this betrothal, the Galilean groom takes the cup. In the Galilean tradition, this betrothal cup is a symbol of their covenant. Offering this cup, the Galilean groom was saying he was willing to give his life for his bride. All that he has, all that he is, he is now offering to his bride as a sign of the covenant he is willing to enter into with her. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 and 28, Jesus took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Beloved, here in this declaration, our Lord Jesus is using the covenant language of the Galilean wedding on the night before his death, betrothing himself to his disciples, who is his future bride. In the Galilean wedding, the future bride sealed by the covenant when she drank from the same cup. Understand, she wasn't forced, she wasn't coerced. It was her choice to make freely. And very interestingly, from that very moment, she was referred to as one who was bought with a price and now was in a binding marriage agreement. The Apostle Paul tells the church, the Bride of Christ, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Oh, beloved, this, this stuff excites me. Because you see that Jesus truly meant what he said and said what he meant. And he said it in a way that these Galilean disciples would truly understand. And the Galilean wedding, as we're studying it, I'm telling you, is confirmation that Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming to return for us. Oh, how glorious. We've been bought with a price. Beloved, this is covenant language. And this describes our relationship with Jesus for those who are truly born again, who are truly hidden in Christ. Now, immediately following their betrothal, the groom would return to the father's house. And he did so in order to build a new room for his bride. And that room would be attached to the father's house. Remember, we read in John chapter 14, verse 2, that Jesus said, In my father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? Did you ever wonder why Jesus had to leave us? Jesus right now is sitting at the right hand of the Father, preparing a place for you and I, those of us who have made covenant with our bridegroom. He's speaking again, covenant language to his disciples. And this is a language that the Galileans of his day would understand as he communicates his future plans for his bride. In the Galilean tradition, beloved, this betrothal took place 
uh, and lasted for at least a year because there was so much preparation that had to be done. I mean, they didn't have Google, they didn't have Amazon. I, they had to travel sometimes miles to get the resources they need to either build the room or for the bride to prepare herself. And that's important to remember because during the time that the groom leaves to prepare a place for his bride, the wise bride is using this time to prepare herself for her wedding day. You see, the bride in Galilee did not know the day or the hour that her bridegroom would come back for her because it was a secret. So she had no time to waste. She was to make every preparation to be ready for his return. She had to make very, very good use of her time. Just like us, beloved. In the same way, we, the church, must make good use of our time in order to live ready for our Lord's return. Because no one knows the day, or the hour. The Apostle Paul warns us in Romans chapter 13, verse 11. You know the time that the Lord, the uh, sorry, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from your sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. <laughs> Did you get that, beloved? Do you understand that Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago? And he's saying salvation was nearer to them now than when they first believed. Guess what? That same salvation is now nearer to us 2,000 years later than it was to them since we first believed. We're living in the time when Jesus can return at any moment. All the prophecies leading to the return of Christ have been fulfilled. And so we must live prepared. We must stay awake. We must be vigilant because the times we're in, look around you, beloved, everything going down all around us is a clarion call for us to be awake and stay awake and be vigilant and pay attention because no one knows the day or the hour. In Galilee, not knowing when the groom would come, wise brides and her bridesmaids began to prepare immediately so they would not be caught unprepared. Now, as I said, the betrothal phase of the Galilean wedding lasted about a year. And it speaks to us that there was a span of time between the betrothal, and the return of the groom. And so this is very symbolic to us that showing us there is a span of time between Jesus' first coming 2,000 years ago and his second coming, which can happen at any moment. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, concerning his coming back for his bride, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father only. You see, in a Galilean wedding, no one knew the day of the wedding, not the bride, nor the groom, the only one who knew the day, the only one who knew the hour was the father of the groom. Again, we see that Jesus is speaking the covenant language of the Galilean wedding to us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. You see, this is a beautiful thing, beloved, because if you could understand the Galilean wedding tradition, you can understand the return of Jesus Christ. You can understand his coming again for his bride. When the bridegroom finishes the building of the rooms unto his father's house, he would wait and wait until the day when the father says, now son, go and get your bride. At the, groom fa at the groom's father's command, the groom would travel to his bride's village and he would blow the shofar 
announcing that he has arrived. And this would take place, beloved, in the middle of the night at a time when no one expected him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52 tells us that when Jesus returns for his bride, we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. Like the blast of the shofar at a Galilean wedding to sound the arrival of the bridegroom, a trumpet, beloved, will sound for the catching away of the bride of Christ to meet the Lord in the air. And this verse tells us that it will be the last trumpet. Now, it's important that you do not confuse this la last trumpet with the last trumpet of the seven trumpet judgments. You see, the sounding of the seventh trumpet in Revelation 11 signals the release of the seven bold judgments, not the taking away of the bride of Christ. Remember, the seventh bold judgment the trumpet, the se I'm sorry, the seventh trumpet judgment is going to be sounded by an angel. This trumpet that will sound before the bride of Christ is taken up in the air to meet the Lord in the air is the trumpet call found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, which states, listen carefully, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Who's gonna have the shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God? Jesus, the Lord himself. And it says, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Beloved, make no mistake, Jesus throughout his ministry on earth warned us that when he returns for his bride, just like the Galilean bridegroom, he's going to come at a time when no one expects. And to those that are not ready, he will come as a thief in the night. But the bride who prepares, the bride who stays awake, the bride who lives ready, hear me, does not have to fear this sudden judgment because the thief in the night will not catch her by surprise. The apostle Paul confirms this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4, where he says, but you brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Beloved, the Galilean bridegroom will come, would come rather, the Galilean bridegroom would come to take his bride to his father's house, to the place that he had prepared for her. And he came into the village at an hour when no one expected him, sounding the trumpet, sounding the shofar. And once the bridesmaids heard that shofar, they knew they had to be ready to leave with the bride immediately. And that meant that their lamps had to have enough oil. This was happening in the dark of night. They needed enough oil to make the long journey back to the father's house in the middle of the night. And Jesus gives us this warning in Matthew chapter 25. After he pre uh, preached his prophetic sermon about the end of the age, known as the uh, Olivet Discourse, which is Matthew chapter 24. He gives us this warning through this parable in Matthew chapter 25. Listen up. He says here, verse 1, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. 
And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you neither know, for you rather know neither the day nor the hour. Beloved, in this parable, the five virgins who had the extra oil represent those who are truly born again, who live longing for his appearing. So they are watching and they're waiting. They live ready. They lived prepared. They lived filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Word of God, making their robes, which is the righteousness of the deeds of the saints, making these robes of righteousness white and pure. These, beloved, are those who live in a state of readiness, a state of preparedness. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14 teaches us what readiness looks like. Listen carefully. As a matter of fact, hold your place in Revelation. You need to see this. Open up to Titus chapter 2, and we're going to read from verses 11 to 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Beloved, are you zealous for good works? Do you spend your time serving yourself or do you spend your time serving God and others? The Lord wants us zealous for good works, zealous, zealous for righteousness. In other words, church, we must live ready. We must live prepared. We must make our garments ready to meet the bridegroom, to honor him with works of righteousness that we performed in faith, putting our trust and hope and faith in him. Oh, I know God called me to do such and such, but Irvin Dorr, you don't understand. I'm too weak. I just can't do it. No, get rid of that stinking thinking. Of course you're weak and you can't do it. But God called you. And if God called you, beloved, he called you to do it through you. He never expected you to do it in your own flesh. He expects you to fulfill the purpose and plan and call of God on your life through and in him. Trusting in him. Get rid of that mindset. We have no more time to waste. Get in doing what God has called you to do and trust and rely on him to equip you, to empower you, to fill you with his spirit so that you can advance his kingdom and get your robe ready. Amen. Now, after the consummation of the marriage, the Galileans would celebrate the marriage for seven days, which we commonly know as one week. Now, this is important, so I don't want you to forget it. You see, in biblical times, biblical end time prophecy, one week is actually equal, equal to seven years. And many Bible scholars believe 
that the Galilean wedding festivities, which took place on earth over a period of one week, which we commonly know as seven days, is actually a type and foreshadow of the wedding celebration of Jesus and his bride in heaven during the seven years of tribulation. And this leads many who hold a pre-tribulation view of the rapture to believe that the bride of Christ is in heaven with the Lord celebrating their wedding while escaping the time of tribulation on earth. Now in the Galilean wedding, the marriage supper was the last of these festivities. And that's what this verse in Revelation 19 is celebrating which is where we are here in Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Take a look now at verse 9. And the angel said to him, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Beloved, in a Galilean wedding, only those who were invited could attend. And if you showed up late, the doors were shut and you could not come in. Sadly, not everyone who was invited to the wedding actually got in because they missed their opportunity. And the Bible clearly teaches us many are called, but few are chosen. Revelation 19, verse 10. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now here, John is corrected by the angel to not worship him, but to worship God, acknowledging that he's just simply a fellow servant of the Lord like him. And he goes on to say, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now I want you to know this angel's proclamation is made to make this point that whether a child of God or an angel of the Most High, we are both in the business of serving him. Amen. Our work is to make him known, whether man or angel. Our work is to make him known. And he goes on to say, it is the testimony of Jesus that we together, both child of God and angelic beings, are in service him to proclaim. We proclaim it on earth and they proclaim it in heaven. And it goes on to say, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit, meaning the purpose of prophecy. Did you get that? Highlight that. Remember that. Write it a few times so you understand the purpose of the gift of prophecy is to exalt Jesus. Not you. Not your gifts. Not your lifestyle. The purpose of prophecy is to testify of Jesus. That's how you know a true prophecy from a false one. All prophecy must honor him, glorify him, and exalt him. And it's told to us in the context of where John was about to exalt and worship an angel. And within that context, get the picture, we're being told, no, 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 no. The spirit of prophecy, the purpose of prophecy is to exalt him. Not man and not creation. Verses 11 through 17 introduce us now to the rider on the white horse. We're coming to a close soon, so stay with me. I know this lesson's a little long. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. 
Here we see Jesus opening up heaven, coming on a white horse. Now in John's day, Roman emperors rode on white horses as a sign of victory in battle. And we know through our previous studies that Jesus is heading towards the battle of Armageddon at this time. And this is a battle, beloved, that is won the moment that Jesus breaks open the sky. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, the Apostle Paul tells us, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Whew, hallelujah! Well, I get it. All Jesus has to do is show up and the war is over. Amen. John tells us in verse 11, Jesus is called faithful and true. These words are endearing, beloved, as they describe the Lord's character, his faithfulness, his righteousness. Verse 12, his eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. Jesus having eyes like a flame of fire, beloved, speaks of him being all knowing and all seeing. Church, nothing is hidden from him. The many diadems or crowns on his head represent his rulership over the nations of the earth. Romans chapter 14, verse 11 states, For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. And Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, the apostle Paul tells us, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come on, give God a shout tonight. Church, he has a name written that no one knows but himself. And in verse 13, John tells us that he sees Jesus clothed in a robe, dipped in blood with the name by which he is called the Word of God. His robe dipped in blood is a symbol of God's judgment towards those that shed the blood of of the saints. He is called the word of God. The apostle John wrote this in his gospel, chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Amen. Jesus is the word of God made flesh who dwelt among us. He now comes in Revelation chapter 16 to execute God's judgment as the living word. The Old Testament prophet Zechariah prophesied the second coming of Christ in Zechariah chapter 14, verses three and four, where he states, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. Revelation 19 verse 14 goes on to say, and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Beloved, now we see the glorious return of Christ and his army consisting of the angels of heaven, his raptured church, his tribulation saints were coming back with him. Verse 15 says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the almighty. The Bible teaches in Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, that God's word, beloved, is sharper than any two edged sword. Jesus will strike down the nations of the earth with the sword of God's word. Jesus will govern sovereignly with his word and his word will be final authority. 
The expression, a rod of iron, speaks of his unwavering government in which everyone will conform to God's laws. Church, you got to understand, this is not going to be a democracy. No, this kingdom on earth will be ruled as a theocracy where God's way is going to be the only way. No more elections, no more votes, no more corrupt governments. God's way will be the law of the land. Verse 16, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Verse 17, then I saw an angel standing in the sun with a loud voice. He called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. What is this speaking of? Beloved, this is speaking of the carnage from the battle of Arn Armageddon, the carnage of the battle of Armageddon, and when Jesus returns to the earth to judge the living and the dead, the carnage of this battle is going to be so great that the Lord assembles the birds of the air to be in position in order to clean it up. Look at verses 19 and 20. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. John describes for us the scene he saw on the battle of Armageddon, on this battlefield of Armageddon, rather. The beast, who is the Antichrist, is there together with all the kings of the earth and their armies. And the battle of Armageddon is the Antichrist, beloved, last ditch, his last ditch attempt to prevent Jesus from establishing his kingdom on earth. But as the next verse tells us, all his efforts fail. Verse 20, and the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. These two were thrown alive in the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. This is the first mention of the lake of fire in the Bible. The lake of fire, beloved, is hell. It is the final destination of the beast and the false prophet, and eventually all those who followed them after the white throne judgment. Verse 21 tells us, And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. As I said earlier, the battle of Armageddon is over the moment Jesus comes on the scene. The sword that comes from his mouth, sitting, the one who's sitting on the horse, is the word of God. Jesus will destroy his enemies with his very breath and the birds of the air will be released to clean up the mess. Church, Jesus is coming back. Make no mistake. And when he comes back for us, remember the image of chapter one of Jesus, where we saw him as he truly is today. See, you have to understand what John was seeing. The revelation, the book of Revelation is the revealing of Jesus Christ, not the revealing of the Antichrist. This revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died and was resurrected, they had a certain image of Jesus, those who were eyewitnesses to those events. But years later on the island of Patmos, when John was given the vision of Jesus as he is today in heaven, it was a fearful sight 
because no longer was he the humble servant sitting on the back of a donkey. No, when Jesus returns, beloved, he's coming back as a conquering king, one whose eyes are like the flame of fire, one whose feet and, and, and legs are like burnished bronze. He's coming to execute judgment before he does that, before his second coming to earth. He's coming for his bride to catch them away, to take them from the earth. Notice it says, where I am, there you may be also. So he's not coming back down to the earth for his church. He's meeting us in the air when he sounds the trumpet that the bridegroom is coming back for his bride. Are you ready? Jesus is calling you. He tells us that we are to seek him while he may still be found, while the grace of God is still tangible and still accessible to us through faith and repentance. Come to Jesus. Don't let another day go by without being given that robe of righteousness, a robe that can only come when you put your faith and trust in the one who gave his life for you, who paid the ransom for your sin, who justified the wrath of God when he hung on that cross. That's who you must turn to now in this hour so that you will be ready and that you may pray to be counted worthy to escape these things that are coming to the earth. So would you pray with us tonight? I would ask everyone from wherever you are, Faith Community Church family, Facebook family, let's pray and let's believe God for an outpouring of his spirit in this hour that his presence would take over the rest of this meeting and that those who are yet to believe will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Father God, we just pray and ask humbly, Lord God, that you pour out your saving grace in this moment. There are those watching, Father, that have yet to believe, and we pray that you, Lord God, will lift the veil from their eyes, that seeing they may see, and knowing they may know the hope of their calling, that they can see you as the Christ, know you as their Redeemer, and be saved by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, you came to this earth to die and suffer for us, that we may live through your grace and through your power. So we pray for those tonight that are yet to believe. Give them that saving faith, Give them the gift of faith and the gift of tears where they can lament over their sin. Your word says all have sinned and fall short of your glory. Let this be revealed to their hearts, to all those watching, Father. Let us never forget the price that was paid by the blood of the Lamb that we may be saved when we put our faith and our trust in you and you alone for our salvation. We ask that this grace and mercy be extended to all those that are watching, that seeing they will see and hearing they will hear your voice calling to them, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, all you who labor and are heavy laden and he promises to give you rest. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you, beloved. It's been my honor and pleasure to serve you tonight. I want you to know on behalf of Pastor Gary, myself, and all of the elders here in Faith Community Church, we're so grateful for your generous online support and your giving to this ministry. For those of you who have given already online, we want to thank you. And we're so grateful for each and every one of you. 
Those of you who'd like to give tonight, please follow the link that we provide below, or you can text the word GIVE to the number we provide below, and it will connect you to our secure online giving platform. God bless you, beloved. It's been my honor to do this teaching and to do this series. We already have a couple of lessons left, so good for you. If you've been following along each and every week, I pray that you're being as blessed as I'm being blessed in going over this wonderful prophetic prophecy that Jesus left for us. God bless you. I'll see you next Wednesday.